The Lord be with you. Good morning, and welcome to worship here at Second Church on this second Sunday of Advent. Please join in our responsive opening gestures. Jesus Christ is the light of the world, the light no darkness can overcome. Jesus Christ is the living word, word and flesh who came to dwell among us. Jesus Christ is living water who sustains a weary world with hope and love. Jesus Christ is the great table host whose joyful feast offers us all abundant life. As we continue in our approach to God, we will join in the chorus of the introit found in your bulletin. Join in our responsive call to worship based on Psalm 72. Give the king your justice, O God, and your righteousness to a king's son. Judge your people with righteousness and your poor with justice. May the mountains and hills bring life for the people. Defend the cause of the poor. Give deliverance to the needy and crush the oppressor. May righteousness flourish and peace abound. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who does most wondrous things. Blessed be his glorious name forever. May his glory fill the whole earth. Our opening hymn is number 59, Comfort. Comfort now my people. Please rise in body or spirit as we sing together.
May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen. As God has greeted us, we greet one another. The peace of Christ be with you. Please share a sign of that peace with one another. Like the season of Lent, Advent has historically been a penitential season, one where we commit to taking time to confess our sins before God and before one another, and recommit ourselves to living as God has called us to. We invite you to join as we sing, pray, and pause in silence all with the awareness of God's abundant love and mercy. Lord, we have not kept watch for you. We have occupied ourselves with our own concerns. We have not waited to find your will for us. We have not noticed the needs of the people around us. We have not acknowledged the love that has been shown to us. Forgive us for our lack of watchfulness. Help us to wait to know your will. Help us to look out for the needs of others. Help us to work and watch for your coming.
Hear these words of assurance and guidance from Romans 15. For whatever was written in the former days was written for our instruction, so that by steadfastness and by the encouragement of scriptures, we might have hope. May the God of steadfastness and encouragement grant you to live in harmony with one another in accordance with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome one another, therefore, just as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. For I tell you that Christ has become a servant of the circumcised on behalf of the truth of God, in order that he might confirm the promises given to the patriarchs, and in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. As it is written, Therefore, I will confess you among the Gentiles and sing praises to your name. And again, rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, let all the peoples praise him. And again, Isaiah says, the root of Jesse shall come the one who rises to rule the Gentiles, in him the Gentiles shall hope. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Thanks be to God.
I'd like to invite the children, those young at heart, to come and join me up on the steps, if they would. We started a new song last week. Do you remember it? Do you need a little refresher, you think? Okay, the first word is lead. Who can show me what the, what the sign is? Do you remember? You're going to lead your hand. Yeah. Lead us to your light. Don't hurt yourself. Lead us out of darkness. Lead us to your light. Come, Jesus, come. Let's sing that together. So we are in the season of Advent. Our color for Advent is purple. And we are lighting candles on our Advent wreath. What color are our candles? Purple and pink. Do you know which ones we're going to light today? What Sunday of Advent is it today? It's a purple candle day. Yep. It's the second Sunday of Advent, and it's still purple. Next week, we get to light the pink candle. So we're going to light two candles today, and we're going to light them when the choir sings to us. And the words that the choir is going to sing this week, they're going to first sing words that we heard last week about waiting for God's coming to the world. And we remember that we're waiting to celebrate what? Christmas, when we celebrate Jesus being born. And what else are we waiting for? I don't know. Are we waiting for Jesus to come back again? Yeah, we are. We think that might happen. We kind of hope it might happen. That's a really confusing thing, even for grown-ups, I promise. So they're first going to sing about that, and then they're going to say, they're going to say, Lord, you are hope. What is hope? A college in Holland? Yep. What else is hope? Anyone know? What's hope? What does it mean to hope? I hope for what? Do you hope for anything? Do you have hopes? <laughs> do you have dreams? Do you hope, do you ever want anything, long for anything? No? Look at these children. They don't want anything. No Christmas presents this year. <laughs> We're all set. No hope needed. But hope is more than just wanting a present. Hope is like a... Boy, I don't even know. How do we describe hope? This big, deep longing inside of us, the sense that that longing could be fulfilled in something else, that that best present is actually possible. Maybe that's hope. So they're going to say, Lord, you are hope. And they're going to also say, Lord, you are healing. What is healing? What does it mean to be healed? Anyone? Healed? Nope. Not a Man, this is a tough crowd today. Healing? Anyone? Healing? It means you get really sick, right? Yeah. That's healing, is to be really sick? No. no! What is it to be healed? Anyone? To get better! To get better. Yes! <laughs> we're praying, we're saying that God is the one who brings healing, who makes us better and can make the world better, because it says, Lord, you are hope and healing for our world. 
So not just for us as people, but for all the world as it goes together. And then it ends with, come now and bring us your good news. Have you ever received good news? Yeah? What kind of good news have you received? Good news. What's good news? Snow days? Snow days. <laughs> Presents? Parties? Party. A surprise visit from one of your favorite people in the world? Would that be good news? No. A birthday is good news? Mm -hmm. What kind of good news do you think this is about? Jesus? Is Jesus our good news? Uh huh. I think so. <laughs> I hope so. There's that hope word again. All right, friends. Since we're just really not getting it today, we're gonna, <laughs> we're gonna let the choir sing us into lighting our Advent wreath. So I need two friends to help light our Advent wreath today. I'm wondering who, um, is there anybody who just had a birthday? Anybody who just had a birthday who would want to light a candle? No. Adelie, would you be willing to light one of the candles today? Yes? No? Okay. Adelaide doesn't want to light the candle. Who has a birthday coming up? Alita has a birthday coming up. Elia has a birthday coming up. You don't want to light a candle? Ada, you have a birthday coming up in January. You don't want to light... Nobody wants to... Do you want to light them both, Alita? Alina, do you want to help light the candles today, too? Okay. Alina and Alita, their names rhyme. They're going to help light the candles. And then remember, after the choir sings, when we get to lead us to your light the last time, then we go back to our seats, okay? All right. Let's sing Lead Us to Your Light. reading from the book of Matthew, chapter 3, verses 1 through 12, found on page 2 of the New Testament of your pew Bible. In those days, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness of Judea, proclaiming, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is the one of whom the prophet Isaiah spoke when he said, The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Now John wore clothing of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then the people of Jerusalem and all Judea were going out to him, and all the region along the Jordan, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit worthy of repentance. Do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our ancestor. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now the axe is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and will gather his wheat into the granary, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. 
Let us pray. God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. For you, O Lord, are our rock and redeemer. Amen. So, Pastor, hearing that passage makes me think of uh, pastor theologian Fleming Rutledge makes a point in her book on Advent that no one, no one adds John the Baptist to any of their like nativity scenes, right? Which, you know, and there isn't really like a great, uh, even Advent calendar sort of leave John the Baptist out. And then I had the thought during the eight o'clock service, how awesome would it be, right? In Zealand, we have these cool yard card things. How awesome would it be at the front of the parsonage to have one of John the Baptist, like in his camel hair saying, repent, right? That would really uh, set us up. That would set a great holiday season, right? You're like, wow, what kind of church is that? Um, so if any of you are artistic like that, uh, I would love that as a Christmas present. Um, our uh, actual preaching passage for this morning comes from Isaiah 1, uh, and by 1 I mean 11, starting in verse 1. A shoot shall come out of the stump of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The spirit of the Lord shall rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. His delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide by what his ears hear, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt around his waist, and faithfulness the belt around his loins. The wolf shall lie with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the kid. The calf and the lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze. The young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the asp. And the weaned child shall put its hand in the adder's den. They will not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain. For the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. On that day the root of Jesse shall stand as a signal to the peoples. The nation shall inquire of him and his dwelling shall be glorious. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So a week or so ago, <clears throat> Miriam and I were driving to Holland on Business 196, and we hit a red light at the intersection of 196 and 112. And as we sat at the light, <clears throat> with the wind whipping from the south, Miriam pointed out a lone weed that had grown out of a crack in the crosswalk concrete. The weed it's, was probably about two feet tall and shaped, someone, you know what I'm talking about, so shaped like a tumbleweed. And we both marveled and how this tiny little tumbleweed-like bush had managed to grow from a small crack in the concrete. And how, in a cold, blustery November morning, it was still managing to hang on, even after the leaves had dropped from the trees and most plants had gone dormant for the season. Even yesterday morning, it was still standing there. Now, as anyone who has tried to deal with weeds knows, right, weeds, especially weeds that grow in weird places, Weeds are resilient. They can be pesky little buggers. They thrive on the smallest amount of soil and the least nutrient-rich of soils. Now, I had this tough little bush in mind all week as I thought about this passage from Isaiah. We read, a shoot shall come out from the stump of Jesse, a branch shall grow from his roots. Now, stumps generally stand as a symbol or the mark of an end. Right? What once may have stood as a majestic and tall tree is no more. Depending on the nature of the stump, we learn if the end was planned, right? a smoother stump the sign of a chainsaw or an axe taking the tree down, or a rougher stump standing as the evidence of a fall. Interestingly, we've come to learn that within forests, trees are interconnected through their root systems. Other trees will share nutrients with a stump, essentially keeping it alive. Not the same as a tree in the prime of its life, but not dead either. It's interesting to ponder what life may have still been coursing through the roots of the stump of Jesse, 
before the shoot sprung up. And once this shoot has sprung up, much transpires. From the shoot comes a branch, and from there, a righteous judge who decides with equity. A wild vision, often referred to as the peaceable kingdom. It's a vision of animals who were once enemies living in peace together. Humans included too. Small children playing with poisonous snakes without any fear. And to top it off, God's holy mountain with no pain or destruction to be found. And the whole of the earth covered with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the seas. All from a shoot, from a stump that once seemed dead. Last week, Pastor Miriam preached on an earlier passage from Isaiah and talked about the amazing word picture that Isaiah painted. A word picture of a time when war would be studied no more and tools for destruction would be turned into tools for cultivation. It continues to be one of my favorite images from Scripture. Now this passage, this vision here in Isaiah, is certainly another word picture. A vision of something that will not be attained or seen this side of Christ's second coming. I mean, maybe on occasion a child will pick up a poisonous snake and not be bitten, but it's probably not that likely, nor something that we should seek out to try and do. And yet, this vision from Isaiah is incredibly compelling. Who wouldn't want to live in a world like this? Who wouldn't want to strive to create a world like this? Who wouldn't want to keep hope alive to live in a world like this? Now, of course, as time progresses, and we continue to live in this world, not in some other one, this vision does not seem to square up with our lived reality. It doesn't seem like the poor are judged with equity. Certainly not in a world where money buys you access to good lawyers and the caseloads of public defenders are overwhelmed on a good day. There's no peace in the animal kingdom, just watch any nature show. And there's certainly not peace in our human realms either. The knowledge of the Lord, actual knowledge, grounded and rooted in scripture and prayer, does not seem like to be like the waters covering the seas. It seems our world is quite far from this vision of Isaiah. Back in the early 19th century, Edward Hicks was a prolific American painter. He was a Quaker by religious background, born around 1780 in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. Hicks was taken by this passage from Isaiah. He painted it, a, a variation of it, 62 different times throughout his life. It was clearly a source of great artistic inspiration. One of the most interesting things about these paintings, to notice them, and here I'm putting on my Jason Osting hat, one of the most interesting things to note is, how, is the eyes of the animals in the paintings. And they are wide open. And by wide open, I mean like wide open, like wider than you can imagine. It's almost as if the animals are looking around at each other, trying to communicate how ridiculous this is, right? It's like, are you seeing what I'm seeing? Oh, my word. In a few of the paintings, a child has its arm around the back of a lion, like a child would with a lion stuffed animal. There's other times the child is playing in between a lion and a tiger. No sense of fear. Most of the paintings have children carrying around snakes with smiles on their faces. Now, Hick's constant return to this vision from Isaiah stemmed in part from some of the utopian strands of Quakerism he found himself involved with. He also deeply believed in the best of what the early American nation was trying to be about. Now, reality sunk in over time for Hicks, as even the egalitarian-minded Quakers split into factions, and some of the uglier strains of the early American nation reared their heads. Later, paintings of this same image show animals baring their teeth, standing with much more aggressive postures. One painting seems to depict a childlike, adolescent Christ figure restraining a lion. There is a the child has a strong grasp on the lion's mane, perhaps preventing it from attacking the young calf that the lion was, only, was lying down with only moments ago. I share this all because I think that Hicks, through his art, lived out the reality that many of us face in our journeys of faith. There are moments and seasons where the vision of Isaiah 11 seems possible. 
Hope is high. God seems to be at work all around us. Our hearts are full of love and the desire to share of our abundance. We could paint that vision of Isaiah, the animals living in peace with eyes wide open and wonder. We could paint it like it was the most obvious thing ever. And there are those moments and seasons where the vision of Isaiah 11 seems like a bunch of malarkey. Right? The future seems bleak. God seems distant. Our hearts are heavy and our spirits are weighed down. If we tried to put brush to canvas, all that would come out would be harsh tones and bared teeth. But I think that one of the most important aspects of Hicks' career, and I might be stretching a bit, a bit here, but I don't think so, I think what was so important is that he kept painting the vision. He kept painting the vision. It took on different hues and the animals took different postures, but he kept clinging to that vision from Isaiah. Even in the face of Quaker division and the reality of a nation in which slavery was still legal, Hicks came back again and again to that vision. Not unlike the tumbleweed bush on the corner of the business loop and 112th, stubbornly clinging to that crack in the concrete, or the chute coming out of the once what seemed to be dead stump of Jesse, Hicks clung to the hope that this vision of Isaiah tried to evoke. And I think for us here in 2022, there is something to learn from this painter and these plants growing against the odds. There is something important about returning to visions such as these again and again and again. There is something to holding on to these visions even in the midst of the struggles of life. There is something to be learned about who God is and who God is calling us to be by revisiting these again and again. Because throughout Scripture, we see that though things may be small, when the Spirit of the Lord rests upon something or someone, great things happen. I didn't note it yet, but verse 2 changes things for the shoot and the branch. We read that the Spirit of the Lord rests or shall rest on him. And in that, then things change. Right? And we see throughout Scripture, the Spirit of the Lord comes to Abram and Sarai, childless and old as they are, and a great nation is birthed from them. The Spirit of the Lord comes to Moses, a stutterer on the run from authorities, and he is the one who leads the Israelites to freedom. The Spirit of the Lord comes to Deborah as she sits under her tree, and she is the one who leads the people and frees them from the oppression of the Canaanites. The Spirit of the Lord comes to Hannah, childless, desperate for a child, and she is the one who gives birth to the great prophet Samuel. The Spirit of the Lord comes to Elisha, the prophet, and the widow's oil overflows so much that she is able to pay off her debt and free her sons from being sold into slavery. The Spirit of the Lord comes to John in the wilderness, dressed in his camel hair, eating honey and locusts, weird as he is, and he is the one who prepares the way of the Lord. Friends, when the Spirit of the Lord moves, what seems small can grow to beyond what seems possible. When the Spirit of the Lord moves, these prophetic visions become reality. They may not come at the time when we want them to come, and they may not look like we want them to look, but they will come. And so we, as followers of Christ, followers of the one who will come again, we persist in our small actions and our stubborn clinging to these visions, trusting that the one who has been faithful will continue to be faithful to the end. Even in the face of the great troubles of the world and the despair that can set in, we continue to raise our lights in the darkness. We continue to love in spite of hate. We continue to widely welcome in spite of rejection. We continue to work for peace in spite of conflict. We continue to be generous with our time and our money in spite of that which tells us to hoard and store away. Fleming Rutledge, who I referenced earlier, writes in her Advent book, such seemingly small actions are part of the eternal plan of God for the salvation of the world. We are not doing it. God is doing it. That's why we can trust the unfolding of his purpose and find our own place in it. Friends, God is on the move. The shoot continues to grow from the stump of Jesse. The earth will soon be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. May we endeavor to join God in this work, 
finding our small part and trusting that God will strengthen us and uphold us as we go about his work. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Beloved in the Lord Jesus Christ, the meal that we are about to celebrate is a feast, a feast of remembrance, of communion, and of hope. I was talking with someone this week who remarked on communion not being their favorite part of the service uh, because we celebrate it so much. And it was reminded, it reminded me that so many of us have grown up with communion being really infrequent in our lives. And that has changed for us here at Second and that we celebrate communion every week together in our worship. And while that stretches us, those of us especially who grew up with it more rare, it strikes me that this practice of coming to communion week after week is our living into that kind of vision, like Isaiah 11, like that painter who just couldn't give up painting that picture. We come week after week to this table to immerse ourselves in this vision of who God is. For here we remind ourselves of God in the way that God loves this world the way that God loved this world so much to send Jesus, the Word made flesh, for us and for our salvation. We remember that profound gift of hope and of healing. We commune together week after week, finding ourselves side by side with those who struggle in this world just like we do. And through the profound work of the Holy Spirit here at this table, we find ourselves drawn into the very presence of Christ, a presence we need more than four times a year and maybe even more than once a week. <laughs> we come to, as a people in need of hope, those in need of living into that bigger vision, of being propelled by that longing, believing that the world can be different, not just when Christ comes again, but as we continue to work together to be those people of peace and justice, those working to create that very peaceable kingdom right now and until Jesus comes again. So friends, whether it's been a long time or you've been here recently, know that it is Jesus who invites you to come, to come and to meet Christ here, to come and to be fed and nourished here. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is truly right and our greatest joy to give you thanks and praise, O Lord, our God, creator and ruler of the universe. The earth is full of your knowledge and glory. You made all creatures to live in peace and safety and sent a little child to lead us. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with choirs of angels, with prophets, apostles, and martyrs, and with all the faithful of every time and place who forever sing to the glory of your name.
are holy, O God of majesty, and blessed is Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Baptized by John, Christ came to deliver us from sin and to pour out the Holy Spirit upon your church. By our faith in Christ, we have the hope of eternal life. Remembering your gracious acts in Jesus Christ, we take from your creation this bread and this cup and joyfully celebrate his dying and rising as we await the day of his coming. With thanksgiving, we offer our very selves to you to be a living and holy sacrifice dedicated to your service. Great is the mystery of the faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these your gifts of bread and cup, that the bread we break and the cup we bless may be the communion of the body and blood of Christ. By your Spirit, unite us with Christ and with your church in all the world. Fill us with wisdom and understanding, knowledge and power, and grant that we may live in harmony with one another as we await the coming of the kingdom of heaven. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor are yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. On the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took bread. And after giving thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, given for you. Every time you eat this, do so in remembrance of me. In the same way, after they had eaten together, he took the cup. And he gave it to them, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Every time you drink of it, do so in remembrance of me. The bread which we break and the cup which we bless are the communion of the body and the blood of Christ. These are the gifts of God given for us, the people of God. We invite you to participate in communion this morning by coming down the center aisle. We'll hand you a piece of bread, get a cup from either side, and return to your seat by the outer aisle. If you are more comfortable being served in your seat, please know that an elder is available to serve you there as well. I invite the elders to come forward at this time. Things are now ready.
come before God with our prayers, just to note that Blaine Knall has been in the hospital for the last couple days. He was having trouble breathing and they found that he once again has pneumonia. He's responding well to treatment and will hopefully come home today or tomorrow, but continued prayers for Blaine, who's also um, re receiving the new regiment of chemo, chemo at the same time. So lots going on in Blaine's body and we appreciate your prayers for Blaine. And certainly we wanna hold the Sherry Holsteg in our hearts too. She's in the hospital having received that big dose of chemo and awaiting a transplant this week. So our prayers are with her as well and with all those we hold in our hearts. Let's come before God with our prayers. God of the peaceable kingdom that Isaiah envisioned, where predator and prey are reconciled and children play in safety, we give you thanks for every step that is taken towards reconciliation among rivals, for every program provided to give children a reliable future. Thank you for policies implemented on behalf of the climate and every vulnerable creature to give us all hope for an enduring future in the world that you love. For peace will not come if the earth keeps tilting out of balance. God of peace with justice, make us better stewards of the gifts that you give to us. God of John the Baptist's rallying cry, you raised up John in the wilderness as a voice calling us to conversion. We thank you for signs of renewal and change in the church and in communities grappling with historic injustice and current outcry. Continue to guide advocates who work for change, who work for change with both courage and compassion. As we await the coming of Christ, awaken the church to new ways to undertake ministry and mission and give us the energy and the resources to reach out in ways that we have yet to imagine. God of steadfast encouragement, Paul called the followers of Christ to live in harmony, to welcome those perceived as strangers to you and to them. Thank you for welcoming us when we were strangers to a new community, a new church, or a life changed by unexpected circumstance. We pray for people who dread this season because life has changed for them. Circumstances might leave them feeling lonely and discouraged. Draw close to those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit, and guide us to reach out to someone who might need comfort or encouragement. God of justice and equity, the Psalms, the prophets, and the gospels proclaim your care for the poor, your expectation that your people will look to the needs of the vulnerable. We thank you that we do have resources to share as a church, as a community, and as a nation. We pray that leaders in each of these spaces will attend to long-standing injustice, to urgent need, without excuse or delay. We pray for those places torn apart by war, for communities devastated by storm, flood, fire, or drought. Challenge any who would hoard scarce resources or profit from the needs of others. Open our hearts to share what we can even as we might face our own difficult times. God of peace with justice, make us better stewards of the gifts that you give to us. Hear our prayers, O God, and strengthen us to serve you in faith and obedience. We offer our prayers through our Lord Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Just a few announcements about our life together in Christ. Um, one, we want you to know that today we're encouraging some sign up for volunteers starting in January. Um, someone might be me, might be someone else. Charlie's going to do it. Oh, you can't say no, to Charlie. no, I can't say no to Charlie. Um, there's a TV out there so that you can read all the spots and the dates and where we need all of those helpers in our various second hour opportunities. If you're willing to sign up, we encourage you to do that while you're enjoying a cup of coffee. 
we'll have that out for the next few weeks. Um, we want you to come back today at 5 o'clock for our second series. It is a handbell duo playing some wonderful um, seasonal music. So we hope you'll come and join us for that at 5 o'clock here in the sanctuary. If you would like to order poinsettias for the Christmas Memorial Garden, those are due, those forms and money are due by tomorrow. So don't delay and drop those off today. You can also do that online. And then last but not least, wanted to call your attention to are coming alongside of families at Roosevelt in Venture again this year. Um, we are looking for some more folks to sign up and participate with that. There are a couple different ways you can engage. One is by picking up some gift cards to some specific stores. Um, and the other is by, uh, if you have time and energy, to go shopping for those who have opted for that option. You can sign up for that using the Sign Up Genius link. If you have no idea what that is and you would like some help, <laughs> you could talk to me, to Lynette, or um, anyone with a smartphone who knows how to use it. How's that? Sounds good. All right. So um, for those who are doing gift cards, we need those sooner than the wrapped gifts because we want those families to be able to go and do their shopping before Christmas. I think that makes sense. Um, and we could use some more of that. There's lots more in your spire, and I trust that you will read all of those things. Um, as we have gathered our gifts before God, we now present those to God. in the spirit of Jesus, we bring our gifts to you, O God. Help us to give with them a ready mind, a willing spirit, and a joyful heart. Amen. I'd like to invite our children and their leaders forward at this time that we might send them on their way. Congregation, what is our blessing? The Lord be with you. Our sending hymn is number 470, View the Present Through the Promise, a wonderful way for us to embrace the vision from Isaiah today.
join in our sending litany. Strengthened and nourished at the table, we, we go, go in the, the now and the, the not yet. yet. Refreshed at the font, we, we go, go in the, the now and the, the not, not yet. yet. Sustained by the word, we, we go in the, the now and the, the not yet. yet. Transformed by Christ's light, we, we go in the, the now and the, the not, not yet. yet. And now, now may, may the, the Lord bless you and keep you. you. May, may the, the Lord, Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May, may the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen. Amen.